The last module 2.1, we reviewed the fundamental principles of vector spaces and various concepts associated with the vector space. In this module 2.2, I am going to provide a quick overview of matrices. I am sure many of you have been introduced to various properties of matrices. I am going to collect all the properties that we would need at one place. So, I would like to make this module as a one stop shop where you can go back and refer to all the basic principles needed to pursue most of what we have to do in data simulation. First definition and basic operations of matrices, a matrix M by N matrix is a real matrix. If it has N row, uh, 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 it has M rows and N columns, there are N M elements each row is a m vector uh, I am sorry each column is a m vector each row is a n vector if m is not equal to n it is called a rectangular matrix i is so any typical element is called a i j i is called the uh, uh, row index j is called the column index when m is equal to n it is called a square matrix square matrix of order n or size n order and size are used synonymously. If all the elements are 0 it is called uh, a 0 matrix or a null matrix. We need a number 0, we need a null vector 0, we also need a null matrix 0. So, we will use the symbol 0, but the context will tell us whether we are talking about the number 0 or the vector 0 or the null matrix 0 but we need all these all these all these objects. More often than not we will be dealing with square matrices. So, A belongs to R of n by n. I would like to be able to say a word or two about R n by n. Please recall we have used the symbol R n to denote the set of all vectors. This is the this is the set of all vectors. this is the set of all vectors. Likewise R n by n is the set of all matrices. So, there are n elements in a vector, there are n square elements in a matrix, each element is a real number. So, there are infinitely many vectors, there are infinitely many matrices in these sets. So, I would like to emphasize this these sets R n, R n by n cross n, they are all infinite sets. Each one is a different object, a vector is an object, a matrix is an object and so on. I can refer to ith row or the jth column. So, yeah, if you go back to the previous slide, this is this is called the this is called the first column, this is called the second row. So, we can talk about the notion of a row of a matrix, it is important to recognize row of a matrix, a column of a matrix. So, a matrix can be represented by represented by sequence of columns or a sequence of rows. So, the ith row is represented by A i star, the jth column is represented by A star j. So, A star 1 is the first column A star 2. So, this must be this must be 2 here, this is not n I am sorry, this must be 2. So, A star 1, A star 2, A star n, these are n columns. A 1 star, A 2 star, A n star, these are n rows. So, this is called column partitioning, this is called row, row partitioning. So, we can talk about partitions of a matrix. Again going back to the previous slide, the element that lie along the diagonal for example, in here that is called the diagonal of the matrix. So, column, row, diagonal these are called different cross sections of the matrix. So, A 1 1, A 2 2, A 3 3 is a vector of size n the vector that lies along the diagonal. 
So, that diagonal is also called principal diagonal of a matrix. All the diagonals that are parallel to the principal diagonal are called super diagonal or sub diagonal. Super diagonals are above the principal diagonal, sub diagonals are below the principal diagonal. These are all nomenclature that one has to remember, these are fundamental to our pursuit of mathematical treatment of data simulation. Now, I am going to define quickly several operations and matrices. I would like to back up a little and, and then explain this now. If I have set of integers, I need to define operations and integer addition, multiplication, subtraction. If you have real numbers, you talk about addition, multiplication, subtraction, division. If you have vectors, you talk about addition, scalar product, outer product and so on. So, what does this tell you? If we have a set of mathematical objects, we have to talk about a set of consistent operation for those sets. So, for numbers there are operations, the real numbers the operations, real complex numbers there are operations, vectors there are operations, polynomial there are operations. So, with respect to matrices likewise we have to have different sets of operations. I am going to quickly define some of the fundamental operations on matrices. So, if I define 3 matrices A, B, C, if I define 3 vectors X, Y, Z, if I define 3 numbers A, B, C, now look at this now I have elements from 3 different animal kingdom, matrices is one class of animals, vectors is another class of animal, scalars are yet another class of animals. I am going to combine all of them to be able to do what I want to do. This is where the notion of vector space comes into play. Sum and difference of matrices is a matrix. So, C is the matrix which is a sum of A plus B, C is the matrix which is the difference of A minus B. These sums are called element wise sum, element wise difference. If A is a matrix, A is a, a little a is a scalar, I can define A to be A times A that is called scalar multiplication of a matrix. You multiply the element, uh, um, 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 each element of the matrix A by the scalar A. I also can combine matrix and vectors this called matrix vector multiplication. I can define a vector y as the product of a matrix A and a vector x and that is defined by y i the ith component of y is given by the ith row of A times the vector. So, in here I am going to represent a little picture to tell. So, if this is the vector y, if this is the matrix A and this is the vector x to compute y i, I take the ith row of A, I multiply that by the vector x and that is a scalar product. The ith row of A is given by A i j, j running from 1 to n. The elements of the vector x is given by x j, j running from 1 to n. So, I am multiplying the first element with the first element, second element with the second element, nth element with the nth element summing them up. So, it is the scalar product of the ith row and the vector x is the y ith element you continue to do for every one of them and that defines a vector that is what is called matrix vector product. So, the I can define now matrix matrix product we talked about several different operations previously look at this now sum of matrices difference of matrices multiplication of a matrix by a constant multiplication of a matrix by a vector. Now, I am going to talk about multiplication of a matrix by a matrix. Multiplication of a matrix by a matrix is also a matrix. It is given by the ith element of the matrix again we all should know if, if I have a matrix C, this C, if I have a matrix A, if I have a matrix B, this is A, this is B. If you consider the ith element in here, this is the ith row, this is the jth column, this is the element C i j. The C i j is essentially the inner product of the ith row times the jth column of B. So, ith row and jth ith row of A and jth column of B the inner product is C i j that is given by this product. There are other ways of looking at the um, uh, matrix product one is called the Sachs P way one other is called the outer product way. I have given these definitions in these. I would like you to verify that the matrix product defined by the inner product Sachs P outer product they all give rise to the same result and I would like to be able to give that as a homework problem for you to work out. I think it will be in illuminating homework for you to verify 
the matrix product can be defined in one of three ways. I would like to now emphasize the fundamental property of matrix product. Matrix product is not commutative that means a b is not equal to b a. Let us go back now if you take two numbers a b a b is equal to b a if you took two numbers a plus b is equal to b plus a if you took two matrices a plus b is equal to b plus a but if you take two matrices a b in general is not equal to b a. So, what does this mean algebra of real numbers is commutative algebra matrix algebra is non commutative matrix product is not commutative and that is a very fundamental restriction when you go from real algebra to matrix algebra that one has to be cognizant of. Now, I am going to define lots of other operations there are ton of operations on matrices which is very rich. If I, if I have a matrix which is m by n I can define a matrix called a transpose of a which is denoted by a to the power t it is n by m the rows of a are the columns of a transpose and vice versa. So, if a is this a transpose is that. So, what are the properties of transposes uh, uh, transpose operation transpose is a very fundamental and a basic operation. So, transpose is called a unary operation. So, I would like to now distinguish between two types of operation 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 can be either a binary operation a binary operation needs two operands for example, to add I need two numbers to multiply I need two numbers to divide I need two numbers. So, a binary operation needs two operands a unary operation on the other hand needs only one operand. What are the examples of unary operation transpose transpose of a negative of a inverse of a. So, transpose negative inverse they are all unity unary operation addition subtraction multiplication they are all binary operation. So, I would like you to be able to be cognizant of the fundamental difference between two types of operators binary operator binary operation unary operator unary operation. This unary operation transpose has several properties transpose of a transpose is itself transpose of the sum is a sum of the transposes <coughs> transpose of the product is the product of the transposes these are all basic properties I am not going to prove them many books that I talked about at the end of module 2.1 has proofs of these in your case if you do not want to prove this at least you should be able to verify how do you verify these take two matrices A and B take a matrix A do these operations and verify. So, I would like you to very strongly recommend please verify these properties is very fundamental to see why and how they operate they work. The next unary operation is called the trace of a matrix trace of a matrix is defined to be the sum of the elements of the diagonal. So, if I have a matrix A it is simply the sum of A i i when i is equal to 1 I get a 1 1 a 2 2 a 3 3 a n n. So, trace is a functional is a function from r n to r you can think of it as a functional the trace has lots of important properties trace of a is equal to trace of a transpose I am assuming a is a n by n matrix trace of a plus b is trace of a plus trace of b trace of alpha times a is alpha times trace of b trace of a b is equal to trace of b a trace is the same when you compute the product a b and b a trace of the product a b c is b c a and c b a you can think of it as a circular property. So, this is a this is b this is c. So, you can think of a b c you can think of b c a you can think of c a b you can you can run around the circle starting at a starting at b or starting at c. So, this is the property f essentially tells you no matter where you start the triple product have the same trace. Then the trace of a times b times a inverse is simply trace of b that that essentially comes from applying the property f to g and again 
I am going to leave all these things as a homework problem I would like you to verify. In other words these are simply definitions I would like you to be able to verify using simple examples it is absolutely essential that we all have a good understanding of these properties. Then is the notion of a determinant of a matrix. I'm I'm trying to list all the properties uh, that that the matrix possess. Determinant of a matrix, we all know. Determinant is again, is a function that maps A to real. The determinant of a matrix is a number. The determinant is defined by the product of the sum of the product of A i j with the cofactors. Everybody should have known the definition of a cofactor. Cofactor is called a signed minor. So, uh, the determinant of a matrix is a fundamental quantity. I am sure most of you should have been introduced to the notion of a determinant. Now, I am going to introduce some of the properties of the determinant. If A is non singular, determinant of A is, is not 0. If the determinant of A is 0, then the matrix is called singular. Determinant of A is equal to the determinant of A transpose. Determinant of AB is determinant of A times determinant of B. Determinant of A inverse is 1 over determinant of A if A is non singular. Again, these are the properties I am going to ask you to verify. So, what, what is the first thing? Ultimately, you know how to prove, but the first step towards proving is to verify. At least you should be confident of the fact, yes, these properties hold. I have already verified using examples, but examples verification is not a proof. Proof is a little bit more abstract. Your proof deals with all the cases, verification deals only with specific instances. So, that is the difference between verification and proving. Proving is the ultimate goal, but to get to prove you need to verify first. So, you need to build your expertise first to verify and then to prove. Now, I am going to enlist properties of several special matrices. First of the property is called symmetry. A matrix A is said to be symmetric if A transposes A. So, what does this mean? If I have a matrix, if I have 1, 2, 3, if I have a 1 here, there must be a 1 here. If I have a 4 here, there must be a 4 here. If I have a minus 1 here, I have a minus 1 here. So, if I took the diagonal element, the upper triangular part and the lower triangular part are mirror images of each other and that is what A transpose A refers to. If A transpose is equal to A means the upper half and the lower half are mirror images of each other. So, symmetric matrices are special class of matrices there is a restriction. The restriction comes from the fact the upper half must be a mirror image of the lower half. A matrix could be a diagonal matrix in this case there are only a diagonal elements all the non diagonal elements are 0. So, what is an example of a diagonal matrix? An example of a diagonal matrix is 1, 2, 3 again 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 that is an example of a that is an example of a diagonal matrix. The unit matrix is a special kind of a diagonal matrix where all the elements along the diagonal are 1, 1, 1. So, in this case this is the diagonal matrix of size 3 this is also a diagonal matrix of size 3 this is a this is a non unit matrix this is a unit matrix. Then we can talk about upper triangular matrix upper triangular matrices are those the diagonal and above the diagonal are non zero. Lower triangular matrices are those where the diagonal and below the diagonal are all non zero this is lower triangular that is upper triangular. Then a matrix can be tri diagonal a tri diagonal matrix is one where the principal diagonal is non zero the first super diagonal is not 0, the, the first sub diagonal is, is not 0, everybody else is 0 that is called tridiagonal matrix. A matrix is said to be orthogonal matrix if A transpose is equal to A inverse. So, orthogonal matrix have this extremely nice special property that inverse is equal to the transpose. These are extremely basic prop these are examples of basic properties of special class of matrices. The special matrices continue. A matrix is said to be skew symmetric matrix if A transposes minus A. So, symmetric matrix is A transposes A, skew symmetric matrix is A transposes minus A. So, in a skew symmetric matrix, A i A i i in a skew symmetric matrices, A i i is equal 
is equal to a uh, I am sorry here it must be i j a i j must be equal to minus a j i and a i i i is equal to 0 if an i is equal to j. So, the diagonal elements of a symmetric matrix uh, skew symmetric matrix is 0. So, what is an example of a skew symmetric matrix 0 0 0 1 minus 1 2 minus 2 3 minus 3 that is an example of a skew symmetric matrix. The diagonal elements are 0 there is a reflection but the sign change. So, a i j is minus a j i. Given any matrix A I can separate the matrix into two parts one is called the symmetric part of A another is called the skew symmetric part of A. The symmetric part is one half of A and A, a plus A transpose the skew symmetric part is one half of A minus A transpose. Therefore, you can easily verify A is equal to A s plus symmetric part plus non symmetric part this is called the additive decomposition of A. Every general matrix can be expressed as a sum of a symmetric matrix consisting of a symmetric part and a skew symmetric matrix consisting of a skew symmetric part. Given any matrix A the product A A transpose the product A transpose A these are two matrices one can generate out of matrix A in other words given a matrix A compute A transpose. So, I have A and A transpose I can multiply A and A transpose like this or A transpose A like that. It turns out A A transpose and A transpose A both of them are symmetric and they have a special name they are called Gramian matrices. Gram is the one who first introduced this. So, these are called Gramian of A Gramian of A are always symmetric for whatever A is. The next one is called the concept of rank of a matrix. The rank of a matrix is essentially the number of linearly independent rows or columns. It can be shown the column rank is equal to the row rank. So, you can think of number of independent rows of a matrix called a row rank. The number of yeah, the number of independent rows of a matrix is called the row rank because the rows are vectors. If I have a bunch of vectors, I can talk about the linear independence of a set of vectors. The number of linear independent vectors is called the rank. So I can think of a row rank of A, column likewise column rank of A. The row rank of A is equal to the column rank of A, and the common value is called the rank of A. So, if A is a m by n matrix the rank of A is less than or equal to the minimum of m and n rank of A is rank is equal to the transpose of uh, is the rank of A transpose rank of a sum is less than the sum of the ranks rank of a product is minimum of the rank of A and rank of B. We have earlier seen outer product of two vectors of the matrix if a matrix is uh, if a matrix arises out of product of two vectors that matrix is always as rank 1. If a matrix is non singular the rank of A is n. So, if A is n by n matrix if it is non singular the determinant is not equal to 0 it is also the fact that the rank of matrix is also n. So, you characterize the set of all non singular matrices to be those with non zero determinant or full rank. So, this is called full rank the full rank condition is the same as non singularity is the same as determinant of A to be not equal to 0. I am now going to review the concept of inverse of a matrix inverse of a ma inverse of a matrix inverse of a matrix is denoted by a inverse and how do i de define a inverse the same way in 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 number theory we say a times 1 over a is 1 we call 1 over a as the reciprocal 
in matrix theory we call it a times a inverse is equal to i we call it inverse. So, inverse and reciprocal are pretty synonymous. The role of number 1 in numbers is the same as the role of number of uh, the matrix i in matrices they are called unit elements if you melt if you multiply any number by 1 is the same if you multiply any matrix by identity is also 1. So, what is 1 for numbers is identity matrix for matrices. So, I would like you to be able to know the property of an inverse matrix um, and through the inverse uh, a times a inverse is i. Inverse is a unity operation inverse of a inverse is a and that should not be surprising because reciprocal of a reciprocal is the given number. So, I have a I have 1 over a I have 1 over 1 over a that is equal to a. So, the reciprocal of reciprocal is the same number. So, inverse of inverse is a inverse of the product is the product of the inverse has taken in the reverse order assuming the matrices are non singular. These are fundamental property which will be used repeatedly in, in data simulation. Inverse of a transpose is the transpose of the inverse and is a combined. So, inverse is one unity operation transpose is another unity operation I am talking about the conjunction between conjunction of two unity operations. So, transpose of the inverse is the inverse of the transpose and that is denoted by a to the power minus t. So, a to the power of minus t means is a transpose inverse I can perform any operation first any other operation second I can transpose an inverse or inverse and transpose both are same they are commutative. Once you have the concept of inverse I am going to introduce you to several different formulas relating to inverses these are called Sherman Marley formula these are called inverse under perturbation. So, if I have an identity matrix the inverse of an identity matrix is equal to itself that is a general property we all know one the reciprocal of one is one the reciprocal of identity matrix is identity matrix. But if I add an outer product matrix to an identity matrix it is no more an identity matrix I know the inverse of identity matrix is its is identity. So, the question is this if I perturb the identity matrix by an outer product matrix we have already seen outer product matrix is of rank 1 the inverse of the sum can be expressed by this formula this formula is called Sherman Morrison Woodbury formula. So, C is the vector D is the vector C D transpose is an outer trans is an outer product matrix. So, this is called a rank 1 perturbation of I f n. So, if I perturb the matrix and compute the inverse I do not have to compute the inverse from ground up. I can simply update the inverse of i with this correction and that formula carries over and these are generalization i can be replaced by a c and d remains the same. Now, a remains the same a is non singular in this case also a is non singular in this case I am assuming a and b are non singular I, 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 I want you to be able to look at this now. C and D are vectors C and D are matrices. So, this is the most general form of this inverse operation this is the simple form of inverse operation it is this version that we will use repeatedly in Kalman filtering techniques. So, Sherman Morrison Woodbury formula D is one of the most fundamental uh, relation that is used in data simulation especially in the derivation of Kalman filters. I am sorry call man filters. So, what does it tell you if you if you if you know a matrix A is non singular if you add a correction to that I can compute the inverse of the correction by simply a correction term the inverse of the original matrix. So, that is a very beautiful formula these formulas have been known since 1930s and mathematicians have done these things just for the fun of it and these formulas find great use in many of the derivations especially the ones relating to Kalman filters. 
I have now given a proof of the Sherman Morrison Woodbury formula. Look at this now, D is the generalized version of the Sherman Morrison Woodbury formula. I have given the proof of this. I am not going to go over the proof because it is given in extremely simple case. So, I am going to leave the proof as a reading assignment. <coughs> I would like you to be able to read the proof as an assignment. The proof is, uh, is, a, is a reading assignment. I have given in, in, in extreme uh, 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 details. All, 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 all the derivations are given. So, now you can see I have derived the formula using these 3 uh, pages of derivations. So, this is one of the fundamental ways in which we can express the Sherman Morrison Woodbury formula. So, this proves the formula D in slide 12 by replacing B inverse by minus B. By letting B is equal to 1 um, I came I can get the formula B, C and A. Now, you can look at this now by this single one single by proving this one single formula I am able to look at this now by proving by proving D using this, this and this I come here then I specialize by choosing several different parameters I derive C, I derive B, I derive A. So, D is the generalization of A, B and C in that particular case. I am not going to go through the proof. The proof is extremely simple in the elementary and I would like you to try your hands on the proof. So, that gives you the general aspect of what is called Sherman Morrison Woodbury formula. The next one is the notion of generalized inverse. We already talked about inverses of matrices which are non-singular. Mathematicians have been indulging in the concept of hey, how do I define inverses of matrices which are not square. So, let us talk about the basic ideas here. Now, I would like you to be able to. to so, matrices square matrix, rectangular matrices, square matrix can be singular, non singular. In the case of non singular matrix, I, I can define A inverse. For a singular matrix, I cannot define it. For rectangular matrices, also we cannot apply this definition of a non singular matrix. So, mathematicians have always been challenging themselves how do I extend the notion of inverse of a non singular matrix to a general case of rectangular matrix to a general case of singular matrix, and that is what is called generalized inverse. Generalized inverse is the generalization of the concept of inverse to matrices that are not necessarily square matrix. The notion of a generalized matrix is very fundamental. The, so, if A is a matrix of size n by m by n A plus denotes the generalized inverse of A, A inverse denotes the ordinary inverse. So, I would like you to look at the symbolism A, A inverse and A plus this is the ordinary inverse this is generalized A plus is the generalized inverse. Moore and Penrose were the first one to define the notion of a generalized inverse. They, they said any matrix A plus that satisfies the properties A, B, C and D with respect to A is called a generalized inverse. In other words A, A plus A must be A, A plus A, A plus must be A plus, A plus A transposes A plus A that means A plus A is symmetric, A, A plus tr transpose must be equal to A A plus A plus is must be symmetric. So, any matrix that satisfies these 4 properties can be regarded as the generalized inverse of A. It turns out if M is equal to N A is non singular all these reduces to the definition of A inverse we already know. Therefore, this notion of a generalized inverse includes the ordinary inverse as a special case as a special case. 
in the case of rectangular matrices when A is a full rank what does it mean? It is equal to the rank of A is equal to the minimum of M and N. In that case we can give specific formulas for the generalized inverse. So, when M is greater than N the rank of A the is said to be full rank if it is of rank N. In that case the A inverse is given by A generalized inverse of A is given by this. In the other case when M is less than N generalized inverse is given by this. We will talk about the occurrence and properties of the generalized inverse when we talk about inverse problem in module 3. When I have already mentioned this but it is worth repeating when M is equal to N and A is non-singular uh, non-singular A plus be becomes A inverse. In that case A plus A A A plus becomes the identity matrix. So, this is a very beautiful mathematically consistent way of extending the notion of uh, extending the notion of of inverse of non singular matrices to rectangular matrices. It can also be extended to singular matrices in much similar fashion, but for case of singular matrices we do not have explicit formulas, but for rectangular matrices with full rank I have very specific formulas for generalized inverse. Again these are the basis by using which we will deal with least squares theory. These generalized inverses occur very naturally in the theory of least squares sorry the theory of least squares. So, these occur in the theory of least squares and we have seen in the in 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 in, in the morning lecture that uh, yesterday's lecture Gauss invented the theory of least squares. Gauss did not know at that time the notion of generalized inverse, but in 1930s they had introduced this notion of generalized inverse and it turns out that generalized inverse and least squares theory least squares theory are intimately associated with, it, with each other. So, it is absolutely necessary that we have a nodding understanding of the moore penrose inverse and the properties. Thus far we have seen several properties of operations on matrices special matrices. Now, matrix can be also thought of as linear transformations of one vector space to another vector space. So, let A be a matrix of size m by n A then as an operator maps the space R n to R m where y is equal to A times x here is the map here is an illustration this is R n this is R m A is the matrix which is m by n. So, if you take a n vector and multiply it by a m by n matrix I get a m vector. So, it transforms n vectors to m vectors and that transformation is is induced by the matrix A. So, we call A an operator or a transformation the word operator and transformation are used synonymously. We call an operator to be or a transformation to be a linear transformation or a linear operator from R n to R m if it satisfies two properties A times x plus y is A x plus A y A times A f x is a times A f x if it satisfies these two properties the first property is called additivity second property is called homogeneity. These two properties if a given matrix satisfies then it is called a linear transformation. So, transformation linear transformation if there is a linear transformation there should also be a nonlinear transformation. So, transformations in general are of two types linear nonlinear. It is a general property every linear transformation can be represented by a matrix that is a theorem in operator theory I am not going to go into that, but it is good to know. So, given a transformation A there are two subspaces there are two spaces associated with it one is called the range space another is called the null space. The so, given A the range space consists of all those vectors y in R m where each y 
is obtained as a product of a and x for all x belonging to r of n. So, looking at this picture a is known I pick x every one of them in r n and then I take every vector through a to this vector. So, the set of all collections y so obtained is called the range of a. The null space of a on the other hand is also called a kernel of a these are different names is the set of all vectors which are annihilated by a. So, a times x is 0. So, x belongs to r n is the set of a x is equal to 0 that is called the null space it is also called a kernel. So, the kernel of a is the set of all vectors which are annihilated by the matrix a. So, I would like to be able to emphasize that given a linear transformation a there are essentially two subspaces associated with it one is called the range space another is called the null space. So, the range space is a subspace of R n the null space is a subspace of R n. So, if I were to talk about the null space is a subspace of R n the range space is a subspace of R n. So, this is the range of A this is the null space of A null space of A. So, you can see I am associating two spaces with a every given linear transformation. Now, uh, I am going to talk about examples of uh, certain operations. Let q be a matrix the, the matrix A is called orthogonal if q transpose is equal to q inverse. Q maps R n to R n is called an orthogonal operator where is a linear transformation is an operation or, op, operator sorry I want to go back yeah is an orthogonal um, operator. So, Q is given by cosine theta sin theta sin minus sin theta cosine theta is a simple example of an orthogonal operator this matrix is also is also called orthogonal matrix orthogonal operator represented by an orthogonal matrix. This matrix gen represents a rotation. So, what does it mean if you have a vector x if you multiply the vectors by q. So, if this is x if you have the vector y y is equal to q times x the length of x and length of q are the same. So, this is called a rotation operator rotation operators are generally uh, denoted by orthogonal matrices or orthogonal matrices represent the rotation operators. So, if you multiply a vector in R 2 by Q you rotate the vector by an angle theta the theta is called the, 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 the theta by which you rotate is called the cos is, is the theta that comes in Q cosine theta sin theta minus sin theta cosine theta are the 4 elements of the 2 by 2 matrix. So, let y be equal to q of x q is called an orthogonal matrix then the norm of the square of y you already know the norm of x square of that is x transpose x. Likewise if you have square of the norm of y this is going to be equal to y transpose y but y is equal to q of x therefore, y transpose is equal to q of x transpose the transpose of the product is the product the transpose has taken the reverse order this is x transpose q transpose. Therefore, if I took the square of the norm of the vector y which is q x transpose times q x this is x transpose q transpose q of x, but by property of the orthogonal matrix q q transposes q transpose q is i therefore, is the x transpose x that is the norm of x itself. So, if y is equal to q of x and q is orthogonal even though y is different from x they share the same length. So, orthogonal transformation preserves 
the length of the vector x. So, the length of the vector x is invariant under the orthogonal transformation and that is the fundamental property uh, of the orthogonal matrices. Now, I am going to quickly refer to coordinate transformations. Again the property of matrices of the linear transformation. Let us consider R of n. R of n is a basic R of n sorry yes R of n is a space every space has a basis the standard basis for R of n is E 1 E 2 E n these are called unit vectors. Given a space there are multiple bases for a given space for example, if I have R 2 E 1 E 2 is one basis I can also consider this is E 1 this is E 2. So, E 1 is equal to 1 0 E 2 is equal to 0 1 I could consider this as this is G 1 this is G 2 what is G 1 G 1 is 1 1 what is G 2 G 2 is equal to minus 1 1 that is the basis this is the basis. So, given a space I can have multiple basis each basis has the same set of elements of vectors. So, if I am considering a space R n I can consider a standard basis I can consider the new basis. The standard basis are listed as E 1 to E n the new basis are listed as G 1 to G n. If I have a set of n vectors I can create a matrix E and E 1 to E n. If I have a set of vectors G I can construct a matrix G G 1 to G n. So, E is the matrix consisting of standard basis vectors G is the matrix consists of the new basis vectors both of them are basis both of them span e are the same equal to R of n. So, it behooves us to ask a question how do these two bases E and G are related to each other. We are going to show that these two bases are are, 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 are are related by a linear transformation and how do we show that. Every element of the new basis G can be expressed as a linear combination of the elements in the old basis because every vector in the new basis is a vector in R n. R n has unit basis uh, 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 the, the standard uh, basis. So, I can express G as the linear combination of the standard basis. If I did this for every g g 1 g 2 g n this is the general expression for g i I can now collate all of them. So, if I have if I consider g 1 g 2 g n in the form of a matrix please understand each g is a vector. So, first vector second vector nth vector this is the matrix this is the matrix g this is the matrix e the matrix e and g are related through the elements t's it can be easily verified that this relation is very fundamental this relation induces simultaneously. So, this is for one g i if I consider all the g i's together this is the resulting relation. So, now you can see g is related to e g is related to e through this matrix t. So, you can think of this as T is a transformation that relates the basis G 1 uh, uh, that relates the new basis with the old basis. So, we can re, yeah we can denote it as the new basis equal to the, the old basis times. So, the, the, the new basis equal to the old basis times T and T is the transformation and it can be shown that transformation is not singular. So, what is the role of a linear transformation role of one of the roles of linear transformation is that it transfers one set of bases of a given vector space to another set of bases and they are related linearly through the linear transformation T.
to the linear transformation t. So, this essentially tells you the coordinates of the new basis and the coordinates of the old basis are related and uh, that brings us to a special class of transformation called the similarity transformation. So, I am now going to be talking about space R n I am going to be concerned with the standard basis B 1 instead of calling it E I am simply going to call it uh, uh, B 1. So, let x and y in R n be the standard basis elements in the standard basis R of n. So, A is the map from R n to R n we can think of this as the linear operator y is equal to A f x. So, now let us think of it now I have R n in one basis I have R n in another basis I have R n in another basis. So, the basis for this is B 1 the basis for this is B 2 and we know that there is a transformation linear transformation T that can map the basis B 1 to B 2 we have already seen B 1 was E B 2 was was G you remember that that in the last slide. So, T is the linear transformation from basis B 1 to the new basis B 2 let x star so, if I consider so both R n's are, are the same space even though I have drawn it differently if there is a vector x here I have a same vector x here this vector has a representation in B 1 this representation this x has a representation in B 2. If the bases are related I can also relate the representations of x in these two bases. So, let x star be a representation of the vector x in B 1 let y star be the representation of the vector y in the new basis. So, if I have t is x is equal to t times t of x star y is equal to t of y star let let y is equal to a of x I hope you understand there are lots of animals here. So, x and y are two vectors in R in the standard basis. A is the linear operator that transforms y to x t is the linear transformation from the basis b 1 to the new basis b 2. So, I have a linear operator I have a basis transformation I have then the representations of vectors from x to y in the new basis if I put them all together x is equal to t of x star y is equal to t of y star let y is equal to a of x that essentially tells you y is equal to t of y star <coughs> which is equal to a of x, but x is equal to t of x star, but y is equal to t of y star. So, if I substitute y is equal to t of y star we get the relation y star is equal to t inverse a t x star. So, you can readily see the relation between y, uh, y star and x star as follows. So, we have not changed anything we are simply concerned with two vectors x and y we are simply representing x and y in two different bases of R n and so A, A is an operator T is the transformation all these things relate to the fund reads to the fundamental uh, result which is given by the star. So, I have a new matrix the new matrix is T inverse A T it is related to A t inverse a t is the representation of a in the new basis b 2. So, this transformation of the matrix a to t inverse a t is called a similarity transformation it again plays a fundamental role in linear algebra. So, similarity transformation is a special class of linear transformation when you represent two vectors in a given vector space and these two vectors are related by an operator A if I change the basis for the same space from B 1 to B 2 then there is a transformation vector T comes into play. So, T A together help us to be able to define the linear transformation. So, this this is called a representation of matrices in different bases. A is a representation in one basis T inverse A T is a representation of the same matrix or same operator in another basis these two are related by the fact 
that are called symmetric transformations. The next transformation is called congruent transformation. Let A be a matrix, B be a matrix. I am requiring B to be non singular, A is any matrix. A transformation from A to B transpose A B is called a congruence transformation. Please remember the differences now. A to T inverse A T that is similarity transformation. A to B transpose A B that is called the congruence transformation. Congruence transformation. So, these are two transformations of matrices that occur very naturally in linear algebra. We the reason we are talking about congruent transformation and similarity transformation because these are special cases of linear transformation. Now, I am going to define yet another concept called the adjoint operator. Any of you who have done 4D war you will know 4D war is also called adjoint method. Adjoint is a property of operators that comes essentially from matrix theory operator theory. So, I am going to quickly define the properties of adjoint operators which are fundamental to understanding data simulation method called 4D war. Let A be a matrix that denotes the linear operator in Rn. So, A matrix, matrix can be called as an entity as a matrix and define the operations on that. A also A, a matrix can also be thought of as an operator of vector on vectors in Rn. So, the same object plays two different roles either a matrix or as an operator. A matrix is a representation of an operator. Now, define a new linear operator A star and the definition goes like this. Given two vectors, so let us talk about this now. I am I am having R n to start with. I am having an operator A in R n. So, what does A in R n means? It takes vectors in R n and maps to vectors in R n. So, let I let, let us pick two vectors x and y belonging to R n. I have been given a matrix A. If I have x and y and A, I can compute the matrix vector product A x that is a vector I, y is a vector I can compute the inner product. So, this is the inner product of A x and y if the inner product of A x and y is related to inner product of x with A star y. So, what does it mean A x is a transformation of A A star y is a transformation of y the matrix A star that forces this equality is called the joint of A it is called the joint of A. So, that is the definition of the property of the joint. This adjoint A is not unknown to us if you look at the standard definition of inner product if you consider inner product of A x and y by definition inner product of A x and y is A x transpose y, but A x transpose y is x transpose A transpose y x transpose a transpose y is x transpose times a transpose y I can I can associate like this. This can be expressed as the inner product of two vectors and that can be expressed as x is equal to a star y therefore, in general the adjoint of a matrix is the transpose the transpose is the adjoint. So, that is the fundamental thing that comes from this analysis. So, for finite dimensional vector spaces if you are considering matrices of finite dimensions the transpose operation is related to a joint. So, transpose is a unity operation we have already defined a simple operation a joint is another concept it turns out a joint can be represented as transposes in this particular case of matrices, but a joint in general is a much more deeper fundamental concept in operator theory in operator theory. So, adjoint of a matrix transpose of a matrix these are unity operations on operators or matrices adjoint of an adjoint is the original matrix. So, adjoint of an adjoint is A, A times A adjoint is A, A times adjoint of A, 
a joint of a sum is a sum of their joints, a joint of a product is a product of a joint taken in the reverse order. If A inverse exists, a joint of A inverse is the inverse of the joint. These are very fundamental properties of a joint with respect to other operations. So, how a joint behaves with respect to a joint, how a joint behaves with respect to scalar multiplication, how a joint behaves with respect to matrix addition, matrix product, and inverse. So, the interaction of two different operations is the topic of discussion in here, the notion of a joint operator and its close relation to transpose. Now, we come to one of the fundamental concepts in linear algebra. Why do we do all these things? Ultimately, we would like to be able to solve the equations. So, given an equation a x is equal to b, under what condition a x is equal to b has a solution. So, we are interested in analyzing the existence of solutions of linear systems. Let a be a m by n matrix when m is equal to n is a special case. So, we are going to start with general general uh, uh, matrices. So, a x is equal to b, a is known, b is known. I want to solve the inverse problem, I want to find an x. Before you compute an x, you have to verify the solution, you have to assure yourself that the solution exists. In this case, a x is equal to b has a solution only when b lies in the range of a. You remember range of a we have already defined. Range of a is the set of all vectors that a maps from the domain to the codomain. We also have talked about null space of a. If I can talk about null space of a, I can talk about the null space of a transpose. So, null space of a transpose is set of all y belonging to R m such that a transpose y is 0 is 0. So, if b belongs to the range of a and y belongs to the null of a then b transpose y is a x transpose y is x transpose a y is equal to 0. Okay, that is a property that follows from the fact that y belongs to the, the null space of a. So, what does this tell you? x belong uh, b belongs to b belongs to the range of a y belongs to the null of a this is the inner product of two vectors one from the range another from the null space the inner product of two vectors 0 means orthogonality. So, this essentially tells you the range of a and the null of a are mutually orthogonal. Please remember this is this is a fundamental property given a matrix a of size m by n we have associated two spaces the range space the null space this essentially tells you the intrinsic property of the behavior of vectors one from the null space another from the range space they are mutually orthogonal. Now, coming back to the existence question there is a famous result by Fadam. Fadam is called Fadam's alternative. Fadam's alternative essentially says the following given a matrix A which is m by n then exactly one of the two statement is true either a x is equal to b has a solution or a transpose y equal to 0 has a solution such that b transpose y or y transpose b is not equal to 0. So, these are the only two possibilities that can happen for a general case of matrices which are rectangular. When m is equal to n A belongs to R n by n, B belongs to R n. Then the non-homogeneous system of equation A x is equal to B has a solution only when A is non-singular and x is A inverse B. That again follows from the alternative A of the Fedham alternative. The homogeneous system A x is equal to 0 has a non-trivial solution only when A is singular. So, these are the two basic fundamental facts. So, what does this say? If I want to be able to solve A x is equal to B, I have a unique solution x is equal to A inverse B when A is non-singular the determinant of A is, is not equal to 0. In this um, um, or else what happens the homogeneous system in this case B is equal to 0 x is, is, is a non-trivial case in this case A x is equal to 0 
has a non trivial solution only when A is singular. So, in this case, the determinant of A is singular. These are the two fundamental uh, uh, differences. So, a homogeneous system has a non trivial solution when the matrix A is singular, a non homogeneous system has a non trivial solution when the matrix is non singular, and these two are consequences of the fundamental property called Fadam's alternative and these two together provides the condition for the existence of solutions of linear system. I am not going to prove the uniqueness you can always if the matrix A is non singular A x is equal to B not only the solution exists we can also show the solution is unique. Once you know the solution exists and is unique we can then try to develop computations to be able to actually develop the solution. To show something exists is one thing to be able to derive or build or compute it is something else, but to be able to compute I must have been assured that the solution exists. The next set of ideas from matrix theory are called bilinear and quadratic forms. Let A be a matrix of psi m by n. Let A be a matrix of size m by n. I am given two vectors x is in Rm, y um, uh, in Rn. I can define a functional defined by A, which is f f a of x of y x transpose ax. That is called a bilinear form. Bil is a linear in x, it is also a linear in y. So, because it is linear in two variables at a given time, it is called bilinear. When I, but when A becomes instead of a rectangular matrix by a square matrix n by n, I can define Q A of x as x transpose A x for x in R n and this is called a quadratic form associated with A. So, this is a bilinear form is a first degree in x and y, a quadratic form is of second degree in x bilinear forms are linear in each of the variable quadratic forms are quadratic in the components of x. So, here is an example of a quadratic form let n be equal to 2 x be a vector x 1 x 2 let a be a matrix given by this q a of x is equal to a 1 1 x 1 square plus a 1 2 plus a 2 1 x 1 x 2 plus a 2 2 x 2 square. You can see the first term is quadratic in x 1 this is the quadratic in the product x 1 x 2 this is the quadratic in x 2's. So, this is an example of what is called a quadratic form bilinear form quadratic forms are special cases of bilinear forms. What is the property of a quadratic form? Let q a be a scalar now in this particular case we already know we already know q a is a quadratic form q a is given by x transpose a x q a is a scalar x transpose a x means what x transpose a x x is a x is a row vector a is a matrix then I have a column vector. So, x is a column vector a is a matrix this is the row vector. So, this is 1 by n this is n by n this is n by 1. So, the whole thing is 1 by 1 1 by 1 is a scalar you all know that basically. The aquatic function is a scalar the transpose of a scalar is itself. So, I can the scalar is its own transpose, but transpose of the product is the product of the transposes taken in the reverse order. We have already seen the product of the unity operation transpose. So, this is equal to x transpose a transpose x. So, this is the quadratic function in q of a transpose f x. So, what is that we have shown a quadratic form of a is the same as quadratic form of a transpose that is the fundamental property. So, if these two are equal I can then write q a is equal to one half of the sum of q a and q a transpose because these two are equal. So, this is equal to one half of the sum of this and that this is equal to x transpose a this is equal to x transpose a transpose a. I can do a little bit of an algebra in here x transpose is the left 
common variable x is the right common variable I can take the right common left common I can arrange the inner matrix as a plus a transverse by 2 you will quickly recall when we talked about decomposition of matrix into symmetric and skew symmetric part this is the symmetric part. So, q of a of x is the same as x transpose a of s times x. So, this is called the quadratic form related to the symmetric part of x. So, if you are interested in quadratic forms we can without loss of generality assume the matrix A is always symmetric. If it is not I can convert the matrix A to its symmetric part I have not changed anything because symmetric part of a matrix is always symmetric A s is equal to A s transpose and this property is routinely used in, in, in data simulation techniques. Again these are all fundamental properties that come from matrix theory. So, quadratic form the quadratic form with respect to a vector each term consists of second degree term as we saw in the previous example x 1 square x 1 x 2 x 2 square. This quadratic form has a special property the special property being the fact that quadratic form of a is the same as quadratic form of the symmetric part of a. Because of this from now on with our loss of generality when we are going to assuming quadratic forms we will only take symmetric matrices. Once you have the notion of a quadratic form I can then find split the idea of, 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 of quadratic forms one is called positive definite quadratic form. So, this is a fundamental uh, uh, concept again let A be a matrix a is said to be positive definite is a definition if x transpose a x is greater than 0 for all x not equal to 0 is equal to 0 only when x is equal to 0. So, this is the definition of a quadratic form. So, what does it mean? In general the quadratic function of a matrix need not be positive, but if a is positive definite the quadratic function always is positive. So, this is the further definition of, of, of positive definite functions or, or positive definite quadratic forms. I hope that definition is very clear. So, I want you to go back. So, we simply define the quadratic form to be to be to be the we define the quadratic forms to be given by this product. In here there is no condition on the sign of this except that this is a scalar. Now, what is that we are saying? this one is not only a scalar, but also it takes a positive value for all x. x can have positive negative elements, a also can have positive negative elements, but if you consider the product x transpose a x it is always positive when x is not equal to 0, it is equal to 0 only if n x is equal to 0. This positive definite quadratic forms have different ways of uh, 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 can be can be explained in different ways there are equivalent definitions for quadratic forms. One definition of quadratic form is what we define, but this definition is not very useful to apply. If I if somebody gives you a quadratic form if I want to apply this definition I have to test it for infinitely many x's it is not possible. So, this is a very nice definition, but computationally not useful. So, there are equivalent definitions which are computationally meaningful. So, tests have been developed to decide under what condition a matrix is positive definite. One of the conditions is if the eigenvalues of A are all positive then it is positive definite. If all the principal minors if, if principal minors of all orders of A are positive the matrix is positive definite. A principal minor is the determinant of a sub matrix. A matrix has several different principal sub minors. So, if all the principal minors of a given matrix are all positive that means the determinants of all possible sub matrices in a given matrix are positive the matrix is positive definite. 
So, these two definitions give you an algorithmic way to test for positive definiteness. This is simply a fundamental definition. This first definition is not very useful in terms of computation. The second view is derived from the first view, but it is very useful computationally. To get an understanding of the constraint on the elements of, of, of A to be a positive definite matrix, let us consider a symmetric matrix A, B, B, C. Please understand with respect to with respect to matrices in the context of positive definiteness, we need to consider only symmetric matrices. So, we can consider symmetric matrices like this. So, if you consider Q A f x for this matrix, this is this takes this form. I can rewrite this by simply completing the squares like this. A simple algebra I will show you like this. This is called the method of completing the square. So, by method of completing the squares, we can express the expression for a quadratic form like this. Now, I would like to examine this expression. What are the conditions necessary in order to make this positive as required in the in the in the, in the condition 1? A square of any number is always positive. So, this term is always positive. So, in order that this term is positive, I have to have a positive. x 2 square is always positive. So, in order that this term is positive, I have to ensure that this term is positive. So, we can state that we can state that a is positive definite in this case, if a is positive, if c is positive, if a c is greater than b square. If A C is greater than B square, this is positive. A is positive. This is positive. I could have rewritten this by completing the square with the other way. That will give you C as positive. So a matrix of this type is said to be positive definite. If A is positive, C is positive. A C is greater than B square. So this is an example with this condition of a positive definite matrix. Of a positive definite matrix. So you can see not every matrix is positive definite. Positive definite brings constraints on the elements of the values of the values of the matrices. 